Hey everybody, welcome to Performance Anxiety, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. We're thrilled to have Mark Bingham on the show. He's had quite a career in the music industry. He got his start by winning a band competition judged by Howard Cosell, which led to him writing songs for Elektra Records in the 60s. In fact, the Everly Brothers recorded one of them. He was there while the Doors were putting together the Soft Parade album, and he's worked with Sun Ra. His stories are incredible, like the time Joni Mitchell thwarted a record deal because of a stolen bicycle. He also tells me who the clown who is sick and does the trick of disaster is from Buffalo Springfield's Mr. Soul. He's staying busy, including playing with Louis Michaud and Michaud's Melody Makers, and they have a new live album out called Cosmic Cajuns from Saturn. Now look for him on social media. Look for us at Performance ANX. And if you like these shows, consider supporting future episodes by visiting Kofi. That's ko-fi.com slash performance anxiety and contributing to the cause. Also, check out Pantheon Podcast Network and listen to other great shows there like Let It Roll, The Imbalanced History of Rock and Roll, and Long May You Young, and a ton more. So without further ado, here's Mark Bingham on Performance Anxiety. Hi, this is Mark Bingham here with the Michaud Melody Makers. Michaud's Melody Makers. It's plural. In fact, there's four of us. And we are a band. And we play Cosmic Cajun music, although we didn't decide it was Cosmic Cajun music. Someone else decided for us. And tonight, you've been listening to me on Performance Anxiety. Yeah, just relax, pour yourself a drink, do whatever you got to do. <laughs> so, this is a nice, relaxed, casual chat. All right. So, well, thank you so much for joining me. I'm, I've been looking forward to speaking with you since I started doing some research and, and uh, finding you know, exactly who you've worked with in the past. It's been, it's been amazing. Well, it's been a lot of it. <laughs> but at first one I want to find out how you got into music in the first place Were, was your family musical family did you start in bands uh, what was your um, first instrument I, I started in bands uh, I think my uh, my dad my dad liked music of certain sorts Okay. he loved Thelonious Monk and he took me to see that when I was you know 10 or something oh, so wow. I was lucky. I got to hear a lot of stuff. And I had moved from Indiana to New York when I was like 13 or something. And so I, when I was in there, that area, I got to hear a lot of great music. Oh, yeah. And um, I heard uh, I got to go to these shows at the Brooklyn Fox Theater so I could see Little Anthony and the Imperials, the Miracles, the Marvelettes, Chuck oh. Jackson. uh and King Curtis was the pit band. Oh, wow. Essentially, I got to see a lot of really amazing black music when I was younger. Yeah. And when I started playing, I just kind of picked up the guitar and I started, uh, I had actually was singing in this band and I played some guitar. Okay. And then I was started writing songs. And then... Um, I wrote songs and then some people liked the songs. And the next thing I knew... I was getting signed up, you know, and to write songs. But the humorous part, which is sort of a metaphor for the entire music business, is that what I had, was writing were constructions, more or less. Okay. I, would, I was, you know, writing a little bit of this, and it would bounce to that. And then I, I was using, I had a friend who had five tape recorders. His dad worked for RCA, oh, the wow. predecessor. NBC, as it were. And so we would go in his basement and we started, uh, this would be like 65, 66, that era. Okay. And we would go there and, and start, and I'd record something, and then we'd play it back on one tape recorder and record it to another. And we kept going. That's how we overdubbed. Oh, so we wow. were weird things. And uh, people, they thought this was really interesting, but the minute they signed me up they said okay now learn to write boy girl songs like john phillips and i was like what oh gee <laughs> you know i don't know how to do that <laughs> what, what are you doing you know so so it became 
I started trying to be a songwriter and write songs, and I was very unsuccessful because I really wanted to just do crazy stuff, and I wanted to be like Archie Shep. I didn't, and so I. It was um, Electra Records, which was an amazing label then. Okay, yeah. Me up as a writer, and they had Jackson Brown. They had a guy named Steve Noonan, who was a good writer. They had a guy named Rolf Kemp that was a good writer. Um, there was a bunch of people. So anyway, it, it was interesting. And I was way out of my element. I was not a hip kid at all. Oh, no. I was, I was just a weird – I was more like – I was a distance runner. I got up every day at 5.30 and I ran seven miles. And, wow. And I was in training and I was a little too slow for the Olympics, but I was pretty good, you know. Oh, wow. And then I just – I was going to go to college on a scholarship and all that, but I was like – yeah, then music came along. I was like, <laughs> let's see, they're going to give you money to do this, or you can keep getting up at 5.30 in the morning, and you're still not going to be, like, all that great. So, right. okay. <laughs> so, I enjoyed running for a long time, but I didn't run competitively since I was 18, you know. Okay. But that was it. So I started in, in with that. I mean, I had bands in high school, and we'd play band battles, and we'd play dances, and you had to learn the, you know, everything from doo-wop songs to all the Motown that was on the radio, anything that was on the radio, plus, you know, Yardbirds, any blues. In the, and we all were started yeah. listening to all the blues stuff that we heard because we learned about the Brit bands getting their stuff from it. Right, right, okay. Oh, so it, it was a time where you learned to play all kind of stuff, and we'd play we'd go from Little Red Rooster to playing the Walker Brothers. Oh, wow. I mean, it was like really eclectic to Jay and the Americans, oh to the slow gosh. dances. And we'd, we'd just play uh, whatever. And we had, and I swear, I think that everyone, now most of the people in my high school band got record deals. So it was a pretty decent band. Wow. Oh, and they had, and this band called Free Beer came out of that. It was a, <laughs> yeah, that's a great name. <laughs> I love that. And they were on Atlantic, and then a band called Papa Nebo, and I can't remember what the other bands. And then my one of the one of the guys that was in that whole scene, he ended up in the band Looking Glass, and they had that song Brandy, and then he yeah. then that turned into Stars with a Z. Oh. So there's a lot. Of, this is all you know, my high school kind of. Oh my gosh! So, well, the Stars was a lot of Jersey guys too. So oh man, I I know I used to live in Jersey. I lived in Jersey for 13 years. All right. So, I know that, in fact, I was reading a little bit of, about your history and that your one of your high school band you won a, a band battle and the judges were Howard Cosell, cousin Brucey, and Bill Harvey. Right. That's I love cousin Brucey. I grew, he was still doing his oldies show when back when I was growing up in in like the eighties and and up into the early nineties. Right. Those were the guy. Though you know, I could do Howard Howard Cosell. Bill Harvey was like not all that impressed, probably because I was going out with his daughter. So that oh. made him a little, that made him like not take me too seriously. <laughs> but Howard Cosell was like, Mr. Bingham's music, his song shone were shining like jewels in the night. Well, you should pre give up your preconceived notions and look at this young man's talents. You know, or whatever. You know, we'd say some shit like that. That's Howard, awesome. He lived in that town. My sister used to hang out at their house. And anyway, so I don't remember him at all. I don't know him. I remember going to get my sister from a play date or something. If I, because yeah. when she would have been four years younger than me. So, you know, if I was 17 and could drive and she couldn't drive and I'd go get her. And Hillary Cosell was there. Anyway. I'm, I hopefully, I, hopefully my sister would hear this and go, you're out of your mind. I never did that. Yeah. But, but anyway, that's memory, you know. And Cousin Brucey just went, Yee! Cousin Brucey, yeah. <laughs> I wish Scott Muni had been there. You know I mean? Oh. They get that whole thing. The Harry w Harrison. Harry Harry, yeah. That was the whole scene there, man. That oh. whole, and Murphy the K. Never w met Murphy Yeah, K, WCBS but. FM. Oh, my gosh. Good radio. That's and then great. And then, so you were in the, in the 80s, and then you had... Uh, what are you, what's the one across the the river there? The really amazing station in uh, Jersey. Oh uh, gosh, uh, it's like the freeform station. What do you call it? Oh, there was well, there was a 
WSOU, which was really FM. Is it FMU? Um, maybe. Well, there was an SOU. I'm not sure. That was more of a college station. No, it's Fairleigh Dickinson. It was that. It was at that school. Oh, okay. I know what you're talking. I don't remember the call signals, but yeah, yeah. I know. And the Columbia talking. Station was amazing, and um, it was so. There's a lot of great, you know, you know. Oh yeah. But so music just got. I just got into the. I got into the music, and I, you know, and largely as a fan, you know, when I was a little kid. I mean, I was like eight or something, and I started before my dad took me to see great stuff. I was totally infatuated with the Everly Brothers. Oh, yeah. And I had a transistor radio, and I'd sleep with it, and they'd have to come and try to turn it off after I passed out because <laughs> I was eating up batteries, I guess. Yeah. But I, And I remember, and I loved the Four Seasons, and I went berserk over. I would stay up because WABC was going to play the new single, and I'd stay up late, late, late in case they played it in the middle of the night. And I remember... I was being a camp counselor out in the middle of the, a field in the middle of the night with my transistor radio and Candy Girl came on for the first time and I just about wet my pants, you know? <laughs> it was so beautiful. And, uh, and then years later, I was working in Malibu on a record and Neil Diamond was working the night times and we were working in the day times. And, and, and then we'd stay there. So I'd hear this Neil Diamond going all night while I was sleeping in the wow. residential part of it and bob gaudio was producing the record and so and he let me play his bass and i Ooh. could tell it was the same bass as like on walk like a man and big girls don't so i was like oh my god i got ah. to play this bass. it was a telecaster bass with round wounds on it oh, i mean wow. flat on it oh boy so I was, whoa of course i wasn't bob gaudio but who is you know <laughs> yeah exactly and so uh but so, so the Everly Brothers did end up recording one of the songs that you wrote, though, right? Well, they didn't. I never heard it again. <laughs> How did you find that out? Is that, <laughs> I, I do my research, man. Is that in some article? Yeah, because they, yeah, I was so excited by it. And here's how you got, okay, I was on Electra. It, the Electra got really weird for me. I mean, Jack Holston only wanted gay Virgos, and I was like a straight Aquarius, although <laughs> I don't know who was straight in those days, because when I moved out there, I moved into this house, and they had pushed all the beds in one room, you know, and I was oh, like, wow. whoa, you know, and like I said, I wasn't really a hip kid, you know, and yeah. <laughs> I was just like, oh, okay, this is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I would, I, I, uh, I would call this guy that was my producer, and you know talk to him and then i'd hear him answer the phone and he would see all the producers in la then they were all the drug dealers that's what's so funny <laughs> all these producers they were all the, the dealers because they had the oh. best weed and they had i guess there's a thing about the higher you get the better you can listen or something or i don't know but I, anyway very I different don't know about that it was a very different world let's just yeah. say that i can and imagine so, so I was out there and I was with Electra for like, oh, I mean, I was still signed to them for a while, but they gave me a job as apprentice producer, which meant I picked up people at the airport. <laughs> ran errands. I listened to all the unsolicited demo tapes. I was the assistant when everyone was so on so many drugs, like the Holy Motor Rounders <laughs> record. I was there the whole time and. Peter Stanfield still doesn't remember that I was even there. Oh, my God. You know, <laughs> and Sam Shepard, me and Sam Shepard are the only people there that weren't on drugs. All Sam was a, you know, he drank, but he wasn't yeah. like. But, uh, yeah, so anyway, I was, so I get up. I'm living in this house in Laurel Canyon. My Electra thing is kind of over. I'm sitting on the couch in this place, and I'm playing, and I'm playing the song, and I'm playing, and this guy comes over to score weed from my producer or whatever he's right. scoring. And the guy, they go in the kitchen, and I'm playing the song over. The guy comes in, and he's like this British dude, and he goes, that's a wonderful song. I think it's perfect for the Everly Brothers, you know. And I was like, oh. Wow. Well, great. So then they signed me up. Oh, man. So, I get, so I'm on Warner Brothers as an artist now. The, the sad part of this whole story here is that the uh, the producer was not only a drug dealer, he was, uh, what do they say in uh, Scarface, using a little too much of his own supply, oh, you yeah. know, or <laughs> getting high in his own supply. <laughs> so he became extremely addicted. And then, oh. uh, and his wife was an amazing musician and was also on Warner Brothers. And 
they were like eating up advances to, and he was shooting it up. And oh, so I just kind of ended up getting out of there. And meanwhile, we cut four songs, two of which came out on a single. Oh. And the Everly Brothers, because of because I sort of left Warner Brothers like that, I never even, I, it, it didn't make it onto any of their records, and I never heard it. Oh man! So it's a weird, one of those weird things, and uh, so the 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 funny backstory of this the producer guy, his wife was an ama- still is an amazing singer and songwriter. Her name was Esra Mohawk, and she had made a record with Frank Zappa oh. under the name her original name was Sandy Hervitz. So Esra Mohawk got signed to Warner Brothers, made this great record called Primordial Lovers. In the meanwhile, her husband is. You know, gone berserk. Yeah, yeah. Husband, Joni Mitchell was our neighbor. Wow. Frazier Mohawk, his name was, he, he, you know, goes down the hill and steals Joni's bicycle. Oh. There's no bike locks in those days. He takes Joni's bicycle and sells it and buys some heroin. Oh, my God. Okay. Then the next day, he goes back to the people, he, the house he sold the people to and steals it again and sells it to someone else. So meanwhile, he he gets arrested. He has to he jumps bail, goes back to Canada where he's from, and never enters the states again. Passed away about I don't know five or six years ago. Oh my gosh! An amazing guy, and he's the guy that he put the Buffalo Springfield together. Oh he's the wow! Guy, okay, he's the guy when they say stick around for the clown who is sick, while the clown who is sick does the trick of disaster. Well, that's him. He was a clown, and he was wow. sick, and he and there were disasters around him constantly. But he was still an amazing man. Oh my gosh, that's amazing! So, so we cut to like it's a few years later. Ezra has gone back to L.A. after being, you know, she they, she had to go live with her mother or something by for a year and blah. You know, she didn't get arrested, but she got like sort of okay, be good. Yeah, and you come back. So she gets back and. Uh, She's going to make this. She's going to work on this record with Geffen, and Joni hears about it and bollocks the whole thing and says, "You can't sign her. She stole my bicycle." (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, you know this is like I'm sure this is an incredibly painful thing for Esther Mohawk. So hopefully she's not listening to it and (laughs) drive down and try to shoot me or anything. Oh my gosh. Anyway, that's, you know, there you go. There's the that, music good for you. That's, <laughs> so, and, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. You, you asked me that. I don't know. Well, I was going to ask, is, that, uh, is this around the same time that you got to, to see one of the Doors records being made? And, and which album was well, that? Well, that was like the, the terrible record, The Soft Parade. Oh, okay. And, well, you know, they spent 900 hours on that record. Oh, my God. Yeah. And they didn't have any songs. They didn't. Okay. The first Doors record to me, amazing. The second Doors record, pretty decent. Yeah. Waiting for the Sun. It's cool stuff. And they started getting eclectic. It was more like that was their uh, version of the REM out of time, you know? Yeah, yeah. We've run out. We Let's put all the old songs that we didn't like to put in our first two records. <laughs> and maybe we'll come up with something and maybe somebody can figure out. And then by then they were cooked. Yeah. So the parade was like and then it was like oh yeah let's let's take this weird band that has no songs left and put strings and horns with it that'll yeah. work so, <laughs> that's all it takes uh so anyway it was but you know i thought jim morrison was a really nice man yeah that's all i could say i mean he was he was nice he wasn't he, the lizard can't you know yeah but that that whole shtick <laughs> yeah. I don't, so yeah when did you move from writing and, and assistant producing to actually being the, the, the full-on producer where you had full control? What was the first job that, that you had well, full control on? Well, I full control. So, like, uh, me as a producer, is full control is never an issue because <laughs> it's not what you do. You, you, you bring this and bring that and do this and do that, and maybe you have a vision, but control is not the right word for it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But, I mean, I went in, let's see, when I went back to Bloomington, at, uh, Indiana, where I was born, and, and I went to, back to school there, and I started working with some of the bands there, and that's when I started doing it. And then I, uh, 
I put together, I kind of joined this band that had been a band for a while, but it was, it was kind of a floating hippie band. And then, uh, okay. And that's about when I started doing it. So I think it might've been 19, I think 1970. Okay. And so, I mean, it, and I'm looking at some of your credits and the, it's blow. It blows me away. Some of these bands have worked with like flat duo jets, Glenn Branca, right. um, John Schofield, REM, um, you know, so how did the REM out of time job come about? I mean, cause you worked on the uh -huh. strings and stuff and, and all for that. Okay. The REM thing, see if I can call it into a short thing. I had, it goes back to working with Hal Wilner. Okay. And Hal, Hal has been, Hal's been three months gone now. Jeez. Oh, wow. Anyway, uh, yeah. He, he died the day there was 1,200 people died in one day in Manhattan. Oh, wow. Anyway, yeah. It's a bummer. You know, Hal, I'd been doing this stuff. I remember how oh right right now i remember it was uh we were doing you know we were doing these multi-artist records with like Thelonious monk or kurt vile and then we were doing one for disney and classic disney stuff okay and it was kind of like um i knew i sort of knew natalie merchant and and i thought well it'd be great to do uh Drip, drip, drop, little April shower, be the tune of Bambi, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, we love movies where they kill the mother in the first <laughs> five minutes. No, um, no it just, that's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> oh, uh, I hated that movie because they did that. They're like, I was, I'm still traumatized. I'm not even know? sure I've ever seen that all the no, way through. Don't, you know, it's it's brutal. It's it terrible. <laughs> Um, you know, and don't go back to Fassbender movies. They suck 40 years <laughs> later. And, uh, what else? Oh, so anyway, so I get Natalie and I'm talking to her and we we're going to do this. Oh, it sounds good. I'm saying, well, we need a back and forth male foil. Said, what about like this guy, Ian from Echo and the Bunny? Oh yeah, that'd be great. What about the, and, and then we could, there were a couple of people she mentioned, oh, we couldn't get them. We couldn't get them. And then she says to me, what about Michael Stipe? So this is 1987. And okay. I go, who's that? Right. <laughs> Literally. I don't know. Yeah. And and she goes, oh, he's the REM. I was like, what's that? She's like, really? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I'm, you know, in the middle of this other stuff. I'm, I live in New Orleans. I'm not on the scene. What do I know? <laughs> so anyway, so I check it out. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, he's cool. That'll work. So uh, anyway he he calls me and i say tell him about it he goes fine and uh anytime i uh if i said anything aside other than what we were talking about directly he would say to me dude save it for the book wow yeah and i was like okay so i quickly learned you know, oh. he didn't want to hear my any of my insight on anything oh, but so Anyway, and then I ask him, well, how's, how's the, what do we do with the money on this thing? And he is like, oh, you have to talk to Jefferson. So I was like, okay. So then this guy Jefferson calls me. And then we set it all up, and we set it all up to record in Atlanta. And Hal can't go, so I go by myself. And we go to the studio. And, and first off, we go, they, they say, REM tells me, oh, you're, you're staying here. And I'm like, because I'm used to crashing on people's ha couches, right? Right, right. I'm not like, you know, these, we were on A&M Records, but this, it was not like we, I mean, we might have stayed at the Chateau Marmont a few times, but it wasn't like, we weren't like rolling in it. Right. It wasn't like our shit. So I get to this place, this hotel, and it's one of these things that's got this huge, it's like got, you know, 400 plants in the lobby and oh. like, and I'm like, wow, this is weird. 
And, <laughs> and, and first off, Jefferson was like, oh, this, this is nothing. You don't, have, you don't have to pay anything because you're doing this thing. And, and I still didn't know who these people were. <laughs> I hadn't figured it out at this point. You know? I was like, okay. So I get to this thing, and they, they give me this key, this special key. And I go to this floor, and you have to open the room. And you walk out, and these people start giving you towels. And, and there's this whole like room full of food for you. Oh, wow. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. So I'm completely... I, and Natalie's there, and I guess my and now anyway. So I'm sitting there. And I go anyway. So I'm completely confused by this. And anyway, we go to the studio. We have a nice time. We went out and got Ethiopian food, and and it all it all worked out. And uh, and then this guy Jefferson was like, "So you got any music of your own? What are you doing?" And I was like, "Yeah, I've been doing a thing with Wilner." And so I sent it to him, and he's like. They had a label called Doggone Records at that point, which I guess was mostly Jefferson's, but okay. had all the side projects of the REM guys. Okay. Like, okay, so they put that out. And and then meanwhile, Michael really liked the Allen Ginsberg record. And Oh, the, uh, the Lion for Real? Lion for Real. And he liked the weird shit that I did on that. So <laughs> when they got to the point of, I, I started visiting them i went to woodstock during the green recordings and okay. they would ask me shit like what do you think about this cello line what about this one you know and i was like ah oh, i like that one you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's good she plays great yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? i mean i don't you know what i know you know so that by that point i knew who they were yeah and at this point i think my son was a baby and michael took all these v videos of him and then he projected them bouncing behind the band on stage. You know, so it was like, whoa. Oh, cool. And so, and then I became friends with Jefferson in front. But the, you know, um, I think Peter and Michael, Mike Mills didn't really, they weren't sure what I was going to, anyway, by the time I got there, they wanted to bring me in, but Michael wanted me and the other guys were like, what do we have to do that for? So it was always a weird thing. And, yeah. and the other guys wanted the whole sample there. And Michael, I don't think, talked to him for a year or looked at him. Oh, wow. You know, they were on stage together. So, you know, it's a very, it was an odd uh, energy with that thing. And I loved a band, you know, after I got over the fact that I didn't, I was so out of it on a <laughs> immediate, you know, who's famous and who's hitting now level. Right. That, you know, I loved the band and I understood them the same way I understood the Grateful Dead. And that the sum of the parts was a zillion times more, you know, it was just then, then if you took those four people just by themselves as players, yeah, Pete Buck's got the greatest A minor in the world, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, and Bill Barry said, oh, he's not that good. Man, as soon as Bill left, the band couldn't groove anymore. Exactly. You know, so it's like, so people forget that it's this weird chemistry between, human beings and it's not about who's better or who's more technique or it's just that you know and uh yeah i mean the dead made all this amazing stuff and they're you know they're all right you know but yeah. it's not not the bill and uh mickey they're not dennis chambers and they're not you know adam deitch or something they're <laughs> like you know they're just guys you know and they were into it yeah. i think the intent you no know, i was almost said intention i'm not gonna go i'm not gonna go <laughs> age on you you know <laughs> remember like uh new agers were into alternative facts way before trump <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors Ugh. So you mentioned that you were in New Orleans at that time what brought you down there you, did you go f from New York to New Orleans well, I went from New York. I was in New York, you know, and I would, uh, you know, I was working. I had construction jobs. My ex-wife was got a job on Saturday Night Live as the photographer, Ooh. and then that lasted a year. And then they were switching around, and and anyway, I was like working construction. She got a job as a waitress. It was the middle of the summer of '82. I was kind of like, ah, I, I'm sick of these. You know, I mean, I was. The scene was like, it was really, I mean, I still have a lot of really good friends from that era, you know? Yeah. 
but it was not something that I really felt all that great about um, musically, you know? Okay. And I liked playing with Branca, but I didn't like, there were certain things. I, anyway, so, and so I just, so we said, well, I was trying to write a play. I had a really crazy idea and I thought, well, I'm going to take some time. Let's sublet our place, go to New Orleans for four months and I'll write and I'll just ride my bike and write and see what happens, you know? Okay. Yeah. So I did, we did that in the four. Meanwhile, Patty, my ex-wife, Patty Perrette, her name is, she got a, a book deal doing a uh, photo book of science fiction writers. Oh, so wow. suddenly on the road taking pictures of Octavia Butler, you know. Oh, it was awesome. Cool. And Sam Delaney and Joanna Russ and and uh, Ursula Le Guin and, you know, Isaac Asimov and, See, you know. I'm jealous of that because I, I was a photographer for years. I went to college for it and all, so that. Oh, okay, well, that. That book is still floating around. Oh, what's it called? I have to, I have to find that. It's called the Faces of Science Fiction. Oh, okay. I'm going to have to look for that now. And, you know, it's, it was like, I think I threatened to kill the guy because the printing was so bad. So, but, you know, <laughs> it's a oh. great way to see a relationship. You yeah. know, but <laughs> I don't do that kind of stuff anymore. Uh, no, I didn't really threaten to kill him. I just, uh, but so, yeah, so we stayed in New Orleans and the guy... Uh, this music writer named Howard Mandel, he had sublet the place and he kept it till 89 when they sold the building. Oh, wow. And so I, so we didn't ever went back to that apartment and I still had my studio space in New York, which I'd go back and forth to. And then Phil Glass took that over. And so I shared that with them for years. Oh, wow. My, my bedroom in the loft studio was the Phil Glass tape storage room so i'd wake up to looking at einstein on the beach <laughs> oh volumes. my god yeah, weird and, and and that was great and i like really like don christensen who worked there and miles green and dan dryden and this kurt monk casey was there and they had a receptionist that hated me and thought i was like the devil though so that <laughs> made it hard <laughs> oh see man her. Looking at me disapprovingly. <laughs> well, I, want, I kind of want to know why she thought you were the devil. I, I'm not really sure. <laughs> so you 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 have worked with some really interesting people, made some really unique music, like Glenn Branca. But you also co-produced Sun Ra's uh, Pink Elephants on Parade. That had uh, to be interesting. Oh, right. Well, you know, I mean, the thing is, that was that was 90% Hal. I mean, I was a Sun Ra fan, and I went to see Sun Ra. And way before that, I had seen Sun Ra like five times. So I knew what to expect. But basically, the funny part was, you know, it was like, okay, you, you, we've got six and a half minutes on this. So, like, make an arrangement for that. Well... And, you know, analog tape running at 30 was, what, 16, almost 17 minutes, and the tape ran out. Oh, so then geez. it was had to cut it all together, and it was before Pro Tools, so that was a huge ordeal to turn that into what it became. But then they got really to it and played a lot of Disney music afterwards, so I thought that was interesting. <laughs> wow. That, wow. You know, became, you know, Disney-fied. Because there was a lot of great music in that, you know, pre, you know, you know, it got weird by the 70s, but, you know. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. <laughs> then it came back. I thought Aladdin was great, but, you know, I think that's a Disney movie. I don't know. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think every version of it is at this point, because they they just released one with, like, a live action type of one. with. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know. But that, you know, there's the the people that wrote that music were really good. You oh, know, yeah. I'm, I'm not a big show tune Broadway fan kind of like i mean i sondheim i work with this guy michael servers who's done all kind of broadway stuff and he's 
and you know he's a, just a brilliant freaking musician he was also in bob mold's band was the lead wow. in tommy you know he's like wow. and he well there's this other this project we've been doing lately this peter stanfell 100 songs okay one song a year for the 20th century and michael service played on that and was ridiculously good and i mentioned this like thinking about aladdin and theater and theater versus music and so many people that are in the theater are great musicians but when they go out and try to do it in the rock and roll world people don't take it seriously because they're actors you know right so stupid because you know service can totally rock and just because he can do sondheim yeah. in a view that doesn't mean he can't rock you know so this yeah. this is one of the weird things that always bugs me is like because you know, so many people have so many great talents, and then people are like, eh, eh, you should go back. You know, it's the stay in your lane. Yeah. yeah you know, and, but yeah. I have, all right, so I have questions. But then, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think I was entirely inconsequential on that. <laughs> and think, I think, I don't know how that ended up in any press except it. Sun Ra was from Saturn, and so is our band, you know. So, <laughs> so I think that became like, oh, okay, worked with Sun Ra. I, I saw Sun Ra once. A friend of mine got really drunk, and he hated the band. And he danced in front of the stage and and said, this is bullshit. This is bullshit. <laughs> and then the whole band started yelling back at him, you're bullshit. Oh, you're <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> and, then he, and then Sun Ra brought a – had a cockroach and somehow anesthetized it. It wasn't dead and put a bunch of rhinestones on it and handed it to someone in the audience. I kind of like that. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. The bluebird Bloomington, Indiana circa 74, maybe. Oh, wow. Anyway. All right. I, I saw two stories that I, I have questions about. Okay. All right. The first one is that uh, NPR is not very happy with you or, uh, Andre Kudrescu. Oh, well, that's so long ago that they wouldn't, the people are NPR <laughs> wouldn't even know we exist. Andre is like an, an old man living in the woods and, uh, and, and he's not on, I don't know if he's on anymore because I never listen to NPR. I mean, I do when I'm driving my car and it's, you know, but I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear the news. You know, I don't even, I don't, yeah. Either. I don't even look at it. I mean, you know, I look at science and I look at, I study economics and I study certain things, but I don't study the idiots. Right. You but, know. So, so this was this was a, the Christmas album that. Oh, we did this. Okay, I would work with Andre on his. Uh, he would, you know, give his little blurbs. He, he, you know, he's the inventor of the word "wannabe" because he called all these girls that uh, were uh, imitating Madonna at a Madonna concert in the early '80s. He referred to them as wannabes, and it caught on. Oh, cool. I never, so, I never knew that. Andre's claim to fame, aside from surviving as a writer and surviving Ceausescu or whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so we did this. So we had this thing that we made a record of, which is a beautiful record. Although it's a, it's a little dated now because it's, that was, what is it, 1997. Right. Yeah. But it's called The Valley of Christmas, and it was a... Uh, Romanian folktale, kind of like the troll under the bridge, but it's about a boy who never wanted to grow old. Okay. And and his adventures finding the Valley of Christmas, where every day was Christmas. And then when he decides he gets sad and he decides to return, he wants to return home in his, in his 65 Thunderbird, and he drives and drives, and he sees nothing but miles and miles of dead TV sets. And, and anyway, so it's bleak. So at the end of the thing, there's no humans left. <laughs> He's the last human on earth and he dies. So apparently they didn't vet. This is the NPR, all things considered Christmas show. <laughs> I, I think that whoever the producer was probably got way worse than we did. Yeah. They, just, they stopped using any of my little tidbits for between things and, <laughs> and they sort of slapped andre on the wrist i guess but, oh, but I, really, I haven't done anything for them since and i <laughs> i did a lot of stuff in the 80s and ni late 80s and early a lot of recording we did blues stage shows and some you know anyway so yeah it's like i wouldn't know oh I wouldn't hear that stuff anymore it's like you know you work on something for a while it disappears and then it's now it's a whole nother thing yeah, <laughs> yeah. but we did do it in, the, in 2000 and 
seven or eight or something. Donald Harrison, the sax player and right jazz composer guy, he uh, he made those da 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 da. He made a bunch of those. Okay. You all think considered themes oh, yeah, 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 yeah. in New Orleans style in my studio. So, you know, so that was as close as I've gotten to them in years. <laughs> all right. So the other question I had, because I didn't really see any details on this. I just saw a little blurb that said you uh, did a, a CD with Andre Williams called Fattening Frogs for Snakes. And you said it was one of the weirdest sessions you've encountered in almost 50 years of recording. Well, Andre, I loved Andre, and, and he, uh, you know, he was around, and he was a friend of John Sinclair. So this is really a John Sinclair project. Callous fingertips pressed down on the strings of beat-up guitars on small-town street corners or broken-down backwoods joints in the darkness of Saturday night. Or on a bright Sunday morning in a ramshackle clapboard church, making music to praise the Lord and give thanks for another. That he brought Andre in to be sort of the music director. But okay. let's just say we were in, we, we had this house in the lower Ninth Ward, right on the industrial canal industrial channel whatever they call it ctc they call it cross okay. the canal okay the ctc <laughs> boys didn't come visit us um <laughs> and so we would set up in there and we had a little pro tools rig it was early pro tools it was 2001 and so we had musicians and sinclair brought some dude came from detroit and uh we were in the middle of building my new studio that i didn't have a place I don't even know if I had a place to live at that point, but, <laughs> but Andre, Andre was in the midst of being Andre, and so we would have good days and bad days. And the, if it, if we stayed under the, if we stayed in one fifth of Bacardi and two walks into the neighborhood, it was a good day. <laughs> so we recorded tons of stuff, and the musician became really frustrated because he would disappear come back and tell him to do something completely different the next time so oh, you know it was kind of wild we had a good and then i would have to drive the singers back to near the airport every day I, you know it was one of those like jobs where honestly i was more like i would run around and get food i would go this or, you know the thing of being yeah. a producer i don't know was i a producer in that what did I, do? I just recorded i don't really know maybe i'm <laughs> no you know that's the thing i don't remember because what do you do, you know, these things that you do. But Andre, you know, brilliant guy. And, you know, in theory, the in, uh, what do you call it, uh, folklore, yeah. <laughs> he, he was Aretha Franklin's boyfriend when they were teenagers. Really? So think about that one. Wow. And he, he was talented enough on a large music scale to conduct C.L. Franklin's choir. Oh, my God. Gosh. So, and then all those great 45s and all the raunchy stuff that he did out of that, you know, yeah. it's, uh, so you see, you know, the, the closeness of heaven and hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the albums that, uh, I didn't even, I didn't actually realize you worked on that I have liked since it came out, really, that I just, in researching this, realize that you were involved in it is uh, James Blood Olmer's album, uh, Bad Blood in the City. Oh, yeah. Well, I just recorded it, and Vernon Vernon played on it. and I, I love Vernon. Dittell and Charlie played violin. Charlie Byrne played violin. Yeah. And Leon. I, I remember that whole session. It was pretty pretty great. I'm a I huge... The bass player, though. Yeah, I'm a huge <laughs> Vernon Reed fan. So uh, when, I, when I saw that... I, I was so thrilled to see that come out. My mama told me Back of the town She said, son Oh, yeah, 
Yeah, no, that was a great record. I thought I wasn't crazy. I didn't mix it, and I wasn't crazy about the mix because they they did the stick the blue the modern blues stick the bass drum up in your face thing, which is not yeah. really the way it was played. And oh, the best God. the best story from that session was okay. I had this guitar for years which originally belonged to John Schofield. Ooh. And they had made two Ibanez in 78 or 79 for John. And John picked the one he liked and gave me the other one. Oh, cool. So I had this forever. And that was in the studio. And Blood, Blood's guitar is tuned E, 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 E. <laughs> and uh, E, an octave lower, E, higher E, octave lower, higher E, you know. Oh, wow. So there's se- so it's it's like strain, you know. Yeah. That's how he played. So in the middle of the session, his uh, guitar broke, and he had to play mine, which was in regular tuning. Oh, God. And he didn't hardly sound any different. So, I mean, he preferred to play in his weird tuning, but when he played on regular guitar, he was brilliant anyway. Oh, my God. It blew my mind. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, so how did you end up meeting Louis Michel? I went to uh, there. Were, I I started going to this. There's a brewery near here, and I went and I had mutual friends that and somebody that at the brewery. One of the brewers was a musician and wanted to do some stuff and liked what I was doing. And Louis was booking all the bands for the brewery, and you know. Louis got listen that going on. Oh yeah, and he played there. So one thing, I started working with this guy at the brewery on his crazy music, and then Louis heard it and he thought it was really cool, and he said he would play on it. So that's that's how I met him. Oh, that's awesome. And I had heard the band a zillion times, and I met him once. Although I don't, I kind of didn't remember this until a few weeks ago when in the restaurant right next to my old studio because his cousin was claiming. She was his sister, and <laughs> and it, like some weird. And I was like, "What?" And they was like, "That's not my sister; it's my cousin." And that's like, and I, you know, it was like a two minute meeting when I was going in to grab a coffee for someone. And I was like, "Oh, okay, well." And he'd been in the studio for something, but I can't remember. And I didn't work on it, and it wasn't like the T Bone Burnett things or any of that. It was some mm. it was some movie, but I can't remember what it was. So, when did you guys start to actually? play together with the Michaud's Melody Makers. What year is this? 20, like two years, about two years ago. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I can forget what year this is. I want to forget what year this is. Yeah. I got my COVID test today. Oh my God. Oh, do you get results or you actually just take it? No, I just took it. I just got the shit stuck up my nose. Oh, my wife had, I, I have had no symptoms. I've been isolated for four months. Yeah. Uh, but I just figured, why not? Better safe I've, than sorry. I've, I've had checkups and I had no fever. I have no this, you know. But you know, I just you never know. Let's go see. Hey, might as well. You know, better safe than sorry. Yep. So, so anyway, Louis. Yeah, Louis was again. They were. Louis had the Melody Makers, which was mostly a trio, and they were playing. And I'd been working with them on in recording them. And, you know, and then on different things with Louie. And then uh, he said, they said, well, come over and sit in. I'm like, great. So I went over there and and it was amazing. And we were like, what the hell? And then <laughs> I just started doing the gigs. It was that simple. Wow. And, you know, to this day, we've never had a rehearsal. Really? No. Well, we've made it all. I mean, Louie directs it and we, we learn the stuff on stage. Oh my and I, God. I played shows with him where we played no songs that I knew for two hours when we were playing for like out in the country. And it was just like, oh, we can't, you know, rev it up. Let's just play, play it straight and let the people dance and do their thing. And, and, and so it's, I like it because you have to listen constantly because Louie's always throwing a left turn in there. So <laughs> it's not like, you can never go to sleep on this band. That's and that's, awesome. I really love that. And the fact, and Brian Weber and uh, Kirkland Middleton are both really, really good. Oh, so yeah. that makes it really fun because, you know, we can really, uh, we can blow it up pretty good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I've really enjoyed the album Blood Moon. That's, yeah. uh, I think, 
dance. I, mean, I, I, my, I can't do Cajun, so I'm going to dance Carré. Carré. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite track off that album. I absolutely love that song. <laughs> You guys just released a live album. Uh, there's right. no song called Blood Moon on the album, but you, on the Cosmic Cajuns from Saturn, there is a song called Blood Moon. Right. And I don't know. You have to ask Louie about that. I have no idea. What I'm so, <laughs> is, it, is Blood Moon, is that a pure improv? No, no. That, okay. Uh, well, that night, uh, no, I think Louie knows what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> We're like going, oh, that's what he's doing. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was like uh, when those things work, they're great. And when they don't work, it's like, you know, Jazz Odyssey at Knott's Berry Farm, you yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully we're, we're on a level that even when it's, you know, we don't play long enough to make it horrible if it really isn't working. So, oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's funny because this is kind of continuing the uh, the, the whole tradition. I, well, not really tradition. I've had let's see, Louis's been a guest on this on the podcast. I've had uh, his cousins, the Rayo brothers, have been on. Uh, okay. I've had um, Johnny Campos came on with. Oh. Yeah, he, he when when Weeks Island came out, he he was on. We spoke with him, and and now you. So this, I'm, I almost feel like part of his family at this point because I've had so yeah. many people involved in his music. On oh, good. Well, you know, you get uh, Brian's got a cool thing coming out with a, a harp player named Cassie Watson, who's really killing it. And oh. so you, maybe you'll get a chance to talk to them, and you can get everybody in the entire. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> What have you been up to besides getting, uh, you know, st stuff stuck up your nose for COVID? Have you been working on anything while everything's been on lockdown? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we, I finished this, you know, the, the Melly Makers record is funny because when we, we we're going to do this live record. And I was like, OK, I'm going to hook up. We're bringing gear in. And I got that. And we got, you know, a good mic preamps. We set it up. We got it sounding good. But I was really it was like, I'm a guitar player on this. I'm not like, you know, OK fine right. so then somebody was gonna mix it and then they mix it and was like oh that's not that's not right and somebody else started oh that's not right so then it was like okay fuck it i'll start so i worked on it <laughs> not right i know but, you know i don't want to know how the sausage was made you right. know i mean i wanted it to i just wanted to have fun and play guitar in a band and right but so i ended up working on that and that was like you know a good amount of work because we had uh four sets to listen to so you had to make refs of four sets listen to it do this do that throw in your two cents and then eventually louis came up with the eight songs that seemed to work for him and and then we you know and worked for everybody So we worked on that, and then what else? And I've been mixing this. Uh, you know Stephen Bernstein? Yes. So I've been mixing this uh, Stephen Bernstein Hot 9 with John Medeski instead of Henry Butler. Oh, wow. Let's mix that record. That's awesome. And then I've been working on this sort of this Hal Wilner uh, memorial thing, which is has the poet Gregory Corso, Marianne Faithful. And Hal talking. Oh, wow. And I've made tracks for a bunch of Gregory poems. And then I made this big, long nine-minute thingy of 
I'll Be Seeing You, which was Hal's sort of signature song. Oh, so, cool. Say. And I got all these different people. I got Willie Schwartz from in Bremen, Germany, to play on the accordion in sort of musette style. And uh, oh, Stephen cool. Burke made a, uh, a brass choir of it, real slow, mournful. Got somebody playing it like a second line, taking it out fast at the end. Oh, man. Uh, so it's and then I made I took all these pieces of intros from like songs from that era and melted them together and then added the forms of I'll be seeing you in the middle of that. So it sounds more like Gorecki or Honduretsky or one of those kind of things, you know, oh. to start off. So it's it's a very bizarre piece. And then it comes in and Gregory of course I was like Greg, of course, was sick in bed, and Marianne and Hal are visiting him, and, and he's like, "Bring my drink, get me a drink," you know. And then, and, and he's like, he wants to drink on top of morphine, you know. It's kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's very surreal, and who knows who will ever listen to it, but somebody will. Oh man, that so sounds awesome! That, and uh, I wrote a book during the whole time. Oh, okay, tell me about that. And, and uh, I wrote a book called "It Ain't My Fault." <laughs> <laughs> Which is, uh, you know, a great New Orleans song of Smokey Johnson that is kind of like the New Orleans national anthem on some level. So it's, uh, you know, it's set in New Orleans in the 90s. Now, my son is uh, teaches creative writing in the university and he, uh, oh, in nice. Alabama, and he uh, is a great writer. Well, and he's, uh, so he's sending, he's been giving me notes. So when he gives Excellent. me, he's supposed to give me notes again tonight. And so then when I redo it, it'll be the fourth draft because oh, wow. I'd never uh, never wrote a book like that before, and it's like, you know, 400 freaking pages. <laughs> it's like, you know, and so I'm not, uh, you know, I ain't Dom DeLillo, you know what I yeah. mean? But <laughs> it's, I think a bunch of people have read it and liked it, and if my son read it and liked it enough to take notes and didn't say, you know, Dad, don't quit your day gig. So yeah. hopefully... <laughs> um, <laughs> So, you know, we'll we'll see. So I'm really that was an that was a great thing to do to just to focus on. And that um, awesome. because I set up to work on songs when this whole thing started and I was here at you know, I've been here by myself since March the eleventh. Wow. And um you know, I was supposed to go to New York all of March and I kinda like it fell through, thank God. Thank God, yeah. Yeah, so anyway. Man. So I um yeah, so it was good, but, but I set up to record songs, and I just didn't feel like playing. It took me quite a while. And then I, I've i been doing this Hoagie Carmichael stuff, this old, like, lost. Hoagie Carmichael wrote, wow. has 40 songs that never came out. So I've been mm -hmm. working on all these old songs and some of his, a few of his classics. And I was going to make a record with that. And then it just, because of all the pandemic stuff, the guitar players in, uh, Chicago, one of the other guitar players won't leave the house that he's in with his parents, oh, and you know, et cetera. So that got put on back burner. But for a while, I got into that again and got back into singing and playing some and feeling like, okay, I'm a musician again. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, but it was good to be a writer for a minute. That well, it sounds like a, a great project. Sounds like it's, you know, really good way to. I don't want to say pass the time, but, you know, something different to do instead of uh, sitting around wondering what in the hell you're going to do when everything gets canceled. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we may not have any gigs for two years. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, I mean, this is the reality. We may not. Who knows? So we're just all sitting here and everyone's flipping out everywhere. And I've seen more people break up, more people. I mean, it's just people are moving here, moving there, getting out of this, doing that. Yeah, it's crazy. And uh, and then and then we uh, like around here today. Basically, what I saw when I went out today, and I had to stop. And they they put a mandate for masks for Louisiana, but mm -hmm. no one was paying attention to it. And the reason was they were saying, well, if you have a medical condition that prevents you from wearing a mask, then uh, then you don't have to wear a mask. Right. And, and we're not allowed to ask. So yep. HIPAA. Do whatever you want. And, yeah. and that's what the this very red state is doing. Yeah. They're going, fuck you to the Democrat governor. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. 
I mean, I've I've kept you for almost an hour now. I mean, I wanted to th- I want to thank you so much. Is there uh, social media where people can follow you for for uh, if the when, if and when the book comes out or any of the uh, music? It will be at some point, but I haven't really. You know, I've I've made it this entire time without a manager wow. or an agent or a website in my entire life. That's so awesome. I, I take I feel like it's like I'm like the uh, Odysseus thing, like where he's uh, he blinds the Cyclops, you know. Yes, and then he could get home like in two days, but he's an asshole, and he tells the Cyclops, "I did it. It was Odysseus who." fucked you up and the cyclops tells his father poseidon and it takes him 10 years to get home yeah <laughs> so that's sort of how i feel about promoting things okay <laughs> <laughs> well uh, everybody keep an eye out for these books and <laughs> the music from mark bingham all right <laughs> man thank you so much for for spending so much time with me and, and tell me some awesome stories these, these stories are fantastic good 